Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. There are so many things to be thankful for. Sally and I focus on just a narrow segment of our Thanksgiving, and that's technology and ministry things, where things were, where things are today, and the wonderful blessings God has given us in order to share the gospel through technology. All that and more. Stay tuned. This is Wells Tech, a show that explores the intersection of technology and ministry. Wells Tech is a part of the Streams Media Network, sponsored by Wells, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Your show hosts are Martin Spriggs and Sally Draper. Join the conversation at wellstech.wells.net. Hello, everybody. This is Martin Spriggs with Wells Tech, episode 317 for Tuesday, November 26th, 2013. Happy Thanksgiving. It's a show where we talk about technology. We give thanks for technology, but more than that, we give thanks for opportunities to use that technology in ministry. And at my side for these 317 times, Sally Draper. Hi, Sally. Good morning, Martin. Happy to be joining you for Thanksgiving week. Went all out with the Thanksgiving decor. I got the Pilgrim and, and Indian along to celebrate with us. <laughs> I knew you'd be excited about that. And even in studio decorations. I mean, we we have just unlimited budget here on Miles Tech. We You're putting out. me to shame. I got nothing here. I was just commenting on that before the show. I really got to do something with my background. I've kind of <laughs> angled the, the camera a little bit differently, so it's... Uh, it's a whole different setup, and I've got opportunity to, to improve that. So I'm sure uh, Lee Hitter, our communications director and broadcast uh, veteran, would shudder if he looked at the background of, of the set here. So we do, have some, we do have some things to be thankful for, though. We're doing another show, and we've done it for these 317 times. And it's Thanksgiving week. Any big, any big plans for Thanksgiving, Sally? Oh, my big plans are to relax. Actually, our church here in New Ulm is, is doing some really exciting Thanksgiving things that I'm involved in. They're having a live nativity at the um, local event center, so I'm going to be participating in that some. And then uh, the New Ulm tradition is a beautiful parade of lights on the, um, Black Friday evening, so a nighttime Christmas parade. And uh, St. Paul's is going to have a live nativity uh, parading through town and are you in it? With that. Yeah, just walking along and in out brochures about the Christmas for Kids program. So it uh, should be a lot costume. of fun. Oh, they have all kinds of uh No, you're not wearing a costume. I, I think I have the option, so we'll see. Oh, We're still out on that. Take pictures, video, <laughs> yeah. whatever. Cool. I'm looking forward to the evening parade. I think that'll be a neat um, thing, and hopefully it'll stay above 20 degrees. Yeah. Not be too cold. We should just have our regular small, small-ish family gathering at our house. For, for whatever reason, Thanksgiving's always at our house. And that's one of those things about family is that you get into these little routines and you just Thanksgiving or the holidays wouldn't be right if it just didn't happen that way. And that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of cool. And uh, we like having Thanksgiving because we get the leftovers. And uh, <laughs> so that's good for me. Uh, Cook maybe lots not and good enjoy for me. the leftovers. It makes, yeah. makes me happy. So, there you go. And I love pie, and I rarely get it, but Thanksgiving I can always count on at least one pumpkin pie. So. Oh, you're a pumpkin pie. My husband likes oh. pecan, so we always have pecan pie here. Yeah, so good. Well, that's kind of the focus of the show, not uh, pumpkin pie but uh, or pecan pie, but <laughs> Thanksgiving and uh, tech Thanksgiving, and there's a lot in that space that we have to be thankful for. One uh, one reason is it, it made this show possible, huh, which we enjoy doing, but it's also improved, uh, I shouldn't say improved ministry, but it, all, it, it certainly gives ministry some tools that you know, maybe even 10 years ago it didn't have. Right. I think if you kind of take a step back and just look at the rapid advancements of technology and how we've put those to work for us um, in ministry, 
it, it's pretty impressive. I know, Martin, you and I were both in attendance at a Lutheran Communicators Conference in 2005. And at that point, I think blogging was brand new and podcasting were brand new. We were hearing about them at that point and getting excited about the potential. So that was just, what, eight years ago. And, um, you know, no blogging platforms existed. No um, free downloads for audio editing were, were out there on the web or anything like that and now basically um, with your ministry message you can self-publish using those kind of tools for free via the internet yep um, I'm thinking 10 years ago email was a big big deal and there mm -hmm. weren't not everybody had email so you had a kind of a close knit group of people that uh, that you could email with you know maybe it was a 10 or 12 people that were maybe using the same service you were that you could communicate with basic websites and if you were uh, in charge of your your school or your church's website at that point if you even had one you probably had to use a tool like front page or some kind of tool that would kind of wrangle that HTML for you and it was very pedestrian uh, just uh, you know, a couple pages and you were so proud you know, of that so a lot of the things that were that we take for granted today in ministry uh, just didn't exist. The platforms were just in their their beginning stages. Um, everything was all when we went to that conference. Everything was really still focused on broadcast TV. Um, uh, podcasting was not a word that we had heard really at that mm -hmm. point. Um, so it was uh, just a, a very different time and and the opportunities for ministry and the opportunity to get the word out and to have conversations like this didn't exist but now they do and they're uh, the used well what a blessing those are right and I think you know even as you described the basic websites and things one component that was missing was the two-way conversation there just really wasn't any commenting or um, you know feedback loops or anything like that it was still kind of a, a top-down message whereas now it's definitely uh, two-way and conversational yeah, blogs were a big part of that. I think that was kind of the first foray into self-publishing, where now you can set up a blog in five minutes, and you know th what you have to say is out there uh, for the world for the world to read and, and comment on and interact with. Um, just a, an amazing tool, and I think the reason that technology gets adopted, and you can see this through, you know, through the ages, is where it becomes easy for the common man. To use so a busy pastor, busy teacher, busy principal doesn't have time to figure out how to to code HTML or figure out what a C what CSS is or JavaScript to to get something out there. But they can sign up for a blog in five minutes and start typing. Anybody can do that. Tag it with a couple things, get the word out what the URL is, and and uh, presto. Yeah, one other. Um thing that's just really amazing these days is how people have used these tools and the number in particular of ministry resources that are available via the web. Um, if you just check out our Wells Tech Ministry Resources page, which is a pretty long page these days, Martin, um, all the different things that we've talked about on the podcast through our six years of podcasting, it's just amazing um, the resources that are available to to help you carry out ministry, not just um, you know publishing, but uh, very niche resources, everything from you know music resources, social networking resources, development resources, um, and the Bible list is just extensive. Um, not just versions of the Bible or electronic Bibles, but um, Bible resources like maps and geocoding and um, Bible trivia challenges, and uh, you know it just goes on and on the number of ministry or resources that are available for use on the web. Yep, that's certainly something to be thankful for, just the fact that we have this list and we have a Sally Draper who's willing to, to put in the time to put that list together, neatly categorized and tagged and appropriately. So if you haven't checked out our ministry resources page, please look at Sally's handiwork. And, and I'm obviously Sally didn't put it all together herself because uh, the resources themselves came from different sources as well. And we're very thankful for any of those submissions that came in and, and made their way to our ministry resources page. Speaking of people, Sally, that's another reason to give thanks because there's there in, in every circumstance, I can't think of uh, really any situations where there's not that 
that tool, that app, that person, you know, that, that network that is available to almost all of us who knows stuff about various technologies uh, that, that we need to be thankful for. You know, we have our own little Wells Tech network, but I think each of our listeners probably has that group of people, and maybe they're that person. Uh, that resource, but uh, everybody has a resource of people around them that uh, can help them out. Definitely, uh, one of the blessings of our Wells Tech community. I, I can imagine or think of times when I get questions. For instance, I'd like to start closed captioning, and I know exactly the people to refer people to in the Wells Tech community that have um, experience and expertise in that area. So I'm I'm super thankful for for all the parts of the techie body that kind of come together and share information through Wells Tech, um, maybe by our listserv or time invested on updating our Wells Tech wiki or whatever it may be. Um, um, the things that we've learned from people, the time they've taken to to record interviews with us, to you know go behind the scenes. I remember when Josh Renner was on from He Loved Us First, um, just showing us his Facebook page and how he does his advertising, you know, uh, step by step. That's just a wonderful blessing um, and and way that technology is is benefiting the Senate at large. Yeah. One other kind of retrospective look at where technology was versus where it is and what we have to be thankful for, I think, over the last three, four years in particular, is the, the whole mobile stuff, uh, where we have, a, let's say, a Wells mobile app or other things like Uversion or things that, that can come along with us. You know, that we can open up in Bible study and and uh, you know, I've, I've done I've opened up my Logos app in Bible study and and, and uh, done some research right there which has really enhanced that experience I did a uh, I was uh, asked to do a Bible study at our church last uh, last fall I guess or no last spring and uh, made extensive use of the glow Bible you know those kinds of technologies tools that that we couldn't have even imagined ten years ago, but now they really are—they are tools in our hand, ministry tools in our hands. Yep, God's works with me all the time, right there in my pocket. It's right. really exciting. So, and uh, technology has connected us to the world, Martin. I know um, we've mentioned already our Wells Tech community and the sharing of ideas that goes on here, and that has literally spanned all the continents and things as we've uh, brought in world missionaries to talk to us about uh, tech efforts in their part of the world and that kind of thing. So um, it just helps us to um, let our light shine uh, no matter what the circumstances. You know, we all have our social networks and, and we can um, connect to people maybe outside of our, our belief system or whatever it may be, but still let our light shine there um, through those connections. Yeah, the the book The World is Flat certainly rings true in, in evangelism circles too. The the advent of technology has enabled us to, to make connections that maybe we would have met not even maybe we would have never made before. Very uh, true. Connecting, meeting people. I mean, this podcast and our community is one example, but you know our our Facebook circles, you know, those people that we interact with, with on Twitter or Pinterest or whatever are, are touches that God has placed into our lives that, that uh, are new to us, you know, in 2013, that have the ability to uh, have a gospel thread that runs through those connections. And, uh, and that's pretty cool. And we should uh, obviously pay attention to that and let our light shine. Um, some people, I think, say technology and social networks in particular have, have kind of cocooned us and we're now behind our little screens and we have our own little lives, but I think used in the right way, it, it really is a ministry tool. Yeah, um, I think other people would argue that perhaps those relationships aren't super deep relationships. You know, right. my high school buddies or whatever it may be that I wish a happy birthday on Facebook once a year. Um, perhaps that's not as deep, um, but I do remember our interview with with author Jesse Rice who wrote the Church of Facebook and his challenge to be intentional with a smaller group you know perhaps um, for the month of December you adopt uh, five people from your friends list that you really haven't had much connection with and pray for them daily and 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 let them know that you care and that you're praying for them you know I think you can um, use those social connections to have intentional deeper relationships yep yep 
Another area is I reflect on what I'm thankful for, in particular with technology, and it comes through, I think, on the show pretty regularly, is, is the enhancements to my productivity, my ability to, to get stuff done with the digital calendar that I keep, which I, I couldn't live without. I mean, I look at my calendar on a daily, you know, hourly basis, and it, having it with me certainly makes a difference. Having a contact list with me, having a task list, with me, even a prayer list that I can take wherever I go, that I have the opportunity to pray through a list that uh, um, you know is is ready when I'm ready to use it, uh, which isn't which isn't always the, it wasn't always the case before. Lots of personal productivity gains that uh, that I've uh, that God has blessed me with through technology. Yep, and we're always learning new ones. There's always um, n new ways to, to enhance that productivity. And uh, maybe one tool doesn't fit you, but other tools do. So right. uh, lots of options there. I think just in general, Martin, we can be thankful for being able to mix technology with ministry. You know, uh, I'm thinking about blogging tools, for instance. You know, I don't think when whoever came up with the idea of WordPress.com, you know, designed that, they were thinking about church websites or or hosting something like Bread for Beggars that is, um, you know, reaching out to the world. Um, but because those tools exist, we can be creative with them and we can find ways to use them to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's just a wonderful wonderful thing to be thankful for. I'm thankful for all the, the creative creativity that goes into um, you know things that we share on this podcast and and people just looking for ways to, to use the gifts that God's blessed us with. Yeah. It's interesting to for me to watch how God wires people up, uh, especially geeks. Because I think that's a lot of the people that we interact with. Yeah, there's this coolness factor where they're you know, boy, have you tried this or we've tried that. Uh, we just had, which we'll play next week, an interview with Ryan Rachi, and he was talking about using Twitter for back channel feedback, and uh, which wouldn't uh, during a during a presentation. So you have to tune in next week to hear that conversation. But uh, uh, but he takes that that interest, that uh, novelty that we find interesting that other people don't. You know, they couldn't care less about WordPress or Twitter or, you know, those, some of those other things. And we care how they work. And But he takes that in us to the next level. You know, those of us that are that are uh, passionate about menace, technology and ministry, and he brings those two together in a kind of a neat place. And that's probably what I like most about Wells Tech, where I get to talk about two things that I love the most with other people who love those two things too, uh, technology and ministry. So I think uh, we thank our Lord for this opportunity and this privilege. I think we, we pray before each of our podcasts, and that's definitely a part of our prayer each time, is by what a privilege this is um, that God has allowed us to do this. Yep. I'm thankful for our Wells Chief Technology Officer in particular because I think uh, the the Senate has benefited from you in that role, Martin, and the, the leadership that you've provided there and the, the vision um, that you've provided to use these kind of tools to God's glory. And so we'll, we'll say an extra thanks for, right. for yeah. the CTO guy. All right. I think it's time to move on. <laughs> we do on. have a ministry. Speaking of ministry resources and, and contributions, we do have one this week. That's correct. And if I were able to share my screen, let's see, I'll be thankful for tech running smooth for me today. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to make mention of a ministry resource we heard from our friend Julia Wagon Connect, who sent us a link to livemocha.com. I'm sure we've probably talked about this on the podcast in the past, Martin, but it has been a while, and I wanted to, to bring it out as a ministry resource because part of our goals in ministry is reaching all people and Oftentimes, language can be a barrier to, to sharing the good news. And Live Mocha is a site that will help you with your language skills. If you're interested in learning another language, you can use this free um, basic service. It, it's a community-based uh, service. Julia writes that uh, students correct and give feedback to other students learning their native language. So you are a learner of a new language while also being a teacher of your native language. It works a bit like social media as you can build a network of contacts to practice your new language. 
um, and he, she has specifically recommended it to many of her English students. So oftentimes Julia's in a in a foreign country teaching English as a second language, and and she recommends Live Mocha to them for that use. So if you're looking to to learn a new language, perhaps Live Mocha uh, is the site for you. I know they have price uh, a price tier, but you can get started with a free account without any problem. Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Julia will be entered in our contest, and I always get these confused: what uh, which prize we're giving for what. But for ministry resources and listener reviews, we're giving away one prize each to one lucky listener, now either an Apple TV or a Google Nexus Seven tablet, one of the newer ones. So if you have a ministry resource like Julie provided, something that, that is useful obviously in a ministry context, not just technology that maybe can be uh, kind of tweaked or, or, or used, but something very specific to a ministry circumstance. Um, that's what we'd like to hear in ministry resources. And then reviews could be of software, websites, hardware, uh, that's going to be beneficial to our listeners who are considering maybe making a purchase or using a service. So those are two areas that uh, we're really looking to build up over the course of this uh, uh, through May is when we'll when we'll close this down. We'll still take them after that, but uh, the the prize will be gi given away at that po at that point. Yeah. Got to get in on it. Martin, do you have a tip this week for us? I certainly do. And um, we've talked about Google Drive in the past. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about an aspect of it that I find uh, very useful, and I think others will too, as we hear more and more about um, schools going into Google Apps. Uh, this, I think, comes more and more into play. The ability to uh, let me just do a quick share here. Uh, to use Google Drive in new and interesting ways, one of those ways is to sync it down to your computer. Uh, it'll sync down to your Mac or your PC. Uh, there's just a little application that you install. And then you can configure it to uh, sync the tools that, uh, the, the folders that you want. Now this was a the new edition of maybe about a year ago where it allows you to uh, uh, pick which folders you want to sync so you don't have everything in Google Drive. So uh, this is where I keep all my uh, family photos, all my personal documents, and uh, basically everything that I used to keep on my on my hard drive is now up in the cloud, but there are certain things that I definitely want to have quicker access to uh, rather than re maybe relying on the cloud to always be there or to have to download it or only view it online, I can have those same files offline. And it keeps things in sync. So if you're working on a local document, you can throw it into your Google Drive on your desktop through this app, and it will, over time, sync back up to the cloud. So it acts as a backup as well. So a couple of different uh, applications for this. Uh, whether it's pictures or documents or scans or, or whatever, just the ability to have those in two places, one local, which you can view offline, and one online on Google Drive, makes this a far more usable tool, and you can use your computer like you always used to. So you don't have to go into a web browser. You can just work on documents locally. And Google Drive is very flexible now in what it will allow you to uh, uh, place up there. So you can use uh, Word documents, you can use uh, you know the, the regular Google documents, Google Docs and spreadsheets and those kinds of things as well. So very uh, reliable I've found and uh, something that you know just if you, many of us are using Google Drive already just a little tip to, to download that uh, local syncing feature and um, have those documents local as well. Yep. I think we're going to be doing that over, that's part of our Thanksgiving holiday is to set up our, our media, our family media PC where we share files um, with the Google Drive sync so that, so that we've got the backup thing going that way. So very timely for the Draper household. Oh. What's yeah. your tip? I have a tip. I have a screen share. Hopefully I can get my thing to behave. 
My tip is related to Gmail because uh, I think I mentioned a week or two ago that I'm going through the um, training for um, Google certification. And I just last week took the Gmail test. So I learned a whole thing, a lot of things about Gmail that I didn't know before. And this one is actually a really simple tip. It's uh, using the shift question mark when you're in Gmail to bring up uh, keyboard shortcuts. I'm not sure if you guys are seeing those or not, yep. but it'll actually overlay your screen with um, a set of keyboard shortcuts. So things like inserting a link. I know as a default in Gmail when I paste in a link of some kind, sometimes it doesn't actually make it active as, as clickable in the message. So I can use Control K to insert the link. Uh, add bulleted list with Control Shift 8 or quote insert you know a, a block quote with control shift 9 so there's some really great keyboard shortcuts and for those of you that are into to um, productivity and things you know that the less your hands leave the keyboard to grab for the mouse to do these things the more uh, speedy your time uh, interacting with the system is going to be. Uh, there's a whole set of additional keyboard shortcuts that are automatically disabled, but you can enable them to do things like um, adding labels, making things starred, uh, going to different uh, sections of your inbox, all kinds of, of shortcuts available. And there's also a link on this overview page, again, with the shift question mark, there's a link that says open in a new window, and it'll actually open up the list of keyboard shortcuts for you on a web page. So we'll include a link to that web page in the, sh in the show notes in case you want to just uh, tag that web page as well. But uh, the big trick is to use shift question mark to bring up the keyboard shortcuts in Gmail. Cool. I bet you were aware of that, Mark. Mark. I was not. Um, okay. I think I've what I <laughs> unfortunately what I normally do, and this is this will be a great help to me is do a Google search for Google or Gmail keyboard shortcuts and then click a link there and it probably comes up with a similar list but this is built right in and I think uh, probably far more useful so there you go shift cool. question mark that's your tip of the and day I, I'm surprised that with a web application like Gmail there are so many keyboard shortcuts that you can use um, I know that do you, do you still have to turn shortcuts on in settings I thought at one point they were by default turned off and you had to go into settings and turn them on and maybe it's switched that now, I don't know. Yeah, that's kind of that second half of the list that I was showing. Whoops, I picked the wrong screen share, sorry about that. <laughs> um, the second half of that list uh, is, is defaulted to being disabled. So if you click the link that's available here on the overlay or if you go into settings you can turn those on. But the first part is available and some basic stuff about um, control enter to send your message or yeah. you know adding bold and italics. I believe those are enabled as a default. It's just the rest of the list that you have to turn on in settings. Okay. All right. Cool. Sally you have the floor. You might as well continue on with your pick. I might as well. It's Gmail centric too and it is actually kind of in line with your drive sync uh, offline. Uh, it's Gmail offline. So if you are a Gmail fan and you want to be able to get to your Gmail when you aren't connected to the internet, there's an app for that. It's in beta but you can download and launch it from the Chrome Web Store and it will allow you to interact with your Gmail basically in their mobile friendly format. So if you're used to working with Gmail on your tablet or mobile device, um, this is going to look super familiar to you. Um, you still get your tabbed um, inbox and things like that, um, but it works offline. The next time you're online, it will sync again, download any new messages, send any messages that are waiting to be sent, that kind of thing. It's a free application and uh, I think kind of a must-have for any Gmail user because there are going to be times when you find yourself without an internet connection. So grab Gmail offline. Yeah. Been around for a while, works well. Very reliable, and uh, yeah, like you say, Sally, if, you're, uh, if you find yourself offline, you don't want to be without the ability to at least uh, read and craft emails. Now, you can't send them, but uh, ultimately when you're back online, then obviously things flow through nicely. Yep. Cool. Uh, let's see. My pick of the week is also from Google, very Google-centric today. Um, 
This is a uh, new and uh, and I little disclaimer here. I have not uh, had any experience with the product other than what I've read and some of the tutorials that I've gone through. But uh, Google is big into education, obviously, with their Chromebooks, and uh, now they're moving in that same direction with encouraging schools to consider using Android tablets. So they've created an entire ecosystem. They call it Google in Education. Or uh, maybe the centerpiece of this is the Play Store now has an education section uh, dedicated to uh, this program. So what it is, and you can read through it on your own if you go to uh, google.com slash edu, uh, you'll find all kinds of information on this. But their Google Play for Education program talks about how to uh, get tablets into the classroom, similar to what iPad or what Apple is doing, trying to get uh, iPads into the classroom, where there's a provisioning process. So you buy the tablet, you get them set up, with student IDs and then you build it with content and the, the content part is what I'm I guess most excited about the ability to curate and find a sec uh, a segment of the vast you know apps that are out there for 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 Google Play and get the get at those apps that are specific to the the teacher and the student needs uh, on, on that particular tablet and so you can buy these apps or if they're free just to procure them through Google Play and have them appear automatically you know on the tablet for for the students to use or if they're for purchase you can buy them as a bundle and you get some discounts etc uh, there's all kinds of walkthrough videos here that and some case studies about how different schools and school districts are using them um, there's uh, just a bunch of resources, and Google does a nice job at that, uh, just putting it together some nice uh, uh, resources that you can get a good idea of what you're getting into if you're deciding to, to go this direction. I think I remember when Jason Schmidt was on our show last time, Sally, that they had decided to take uh, a plunge, and we're going to, in their school district, we're going to use Nexus 7 tablets, like is shown here, and I'm sure this was one of the reasons why they... They felt that that was a viable option with this uh, Google Apps for Education and the Play Store or Google Play for Education, the ability to, to put together a cohesive uh, platform that kids could use the tablets effectively for a one-to-one -one tablet scenario. So. Sounds like the management is kind of parallel to Chromebook management. Yeah, yeah. So you can uh, administer things from your centralized uh, account, perhaps um, parallel that you could say certain devices get certain apps for this grade level exactly. or that grade level. So that's that's exciting to see that they're. Um, I think the Chromebook management is just uh, a wonderful breakthrough as opposed to a computer lab where you have to go computer to computer and install things or whatever. And so um, I. I like that it's coming to tablets as well. Very good. And one of the one of the appeals, of course, of going with Google tablets is they're they're they are cheaper than going with iPads, uh, significantly cheaper. I don't know if they're any better or worse. Uh, I think they're they're on pretty even footing at this point. But uh, the fact that these companies are recognizing that this is a market that needs to be served is a win for I think our, our elementary and and high schools. Uh, you know, within our synod and uh, within parochial school circles in general. All right. Time for some Wells.net features. And actually, this kind of spans a lot of different areas. Um, but it is the beginning of a new church calendar year, uh, starting with this upcoming Sunday. We'll be in the Advent season. And we have several different flavors of the church year calendar for 2013-14. Uh, first of all, from our friends at Northwestern Publishing House, there's a one-page um, church year calendar, which shows the colors of the church year, along with the traditional reading schedule for the church year um, by date. So it's specific to 2013-14 um, dates. Um, from the worship office, we'll also point you to the Planning Christian Worship document for year A, which has all the readings, including the, the new supplemental readings, um, hymns of the day, and additional hymns to select from, and all of those things that you might need, um, particularly as a pastor planning for 
Christian worship services. And then finally, an offshoot from the worship department, we have put together a lectionary calendar um, using the Google Calendar tool, and there's information about it on our Wells Tech Wiki. You can read all about it. Um, and then you can link to the tool um, to the, to the Google Calendar, you can add it to your Google Calendar with the one-click button that's available that says Google Calendar. And then as um, the dates roll around, I'm looking at November right now, but if you go to December 1st, then you'll see that Advent 1, and this would be um, for the Year A church calendar. And it does have um, all the lessons, including the supplemental lectionary, uh, lessons, the prayer of the day, the verse of the day, hymn of the day, and the color. And so this might be useful, um, obviously, for pastors who are doing worship planning, but also for anyone involved in that worship planning process. I'm thinking particularly of, of musicians who are part of um, the, the planning for worship. Maybe choir directors want to know what the readings are for that Sunday or whatever. Um, just plunk it into your Google Calendar and away you go. And, um, and it has the entire upcoming church year all ready for you and laid out. So lots of calendars for you to use to approach a brand new church year. Happy New Year. Cool. We should probably remind our or make our listeners aware that there are plenty of opportunities to enjoy Christmas concerts online through our streams live service and uh, one of those will be the Christmas concert put on by Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, the chorus there. That's going to be December 8th at 3 o'clock. And then uh, Koine is going to be performing and streaming their concert live from Kettle Moraine Lutheran December 19th at 7 o'clock. And uh, MLC's, uh, we've got an MLC listing here, Sally. Do we have any more specifics on when their concert is? <laughs> we do. I believe it is that same weekend as the seminary concert. So they have a Saturday concert in the evening, I believe at 7 p.m., and then a Sunday concert at 4 p.m. on December 7th and 8th. And both right. of those will be streamed via the MLC TV channel. Right. So make sure and uh, check out the show notes for that link as well. Yeah, for the others, uh, you can go to wells.net and click on the, uh, the live uh, link at the top. So yep. under media. Or streams media, I believe it is. Let's move on to community feedback. We had, yeah. uh, as we maybe expected, some some feedback on our PC versus Mac conversation. That's right. Um, right off the bat, apparently we forgot to mention Linux in the conversation, <laughs> Martin. <laughs> and you know, it was funny. Yeah. <laughs> it was in our show notes, but we glanced right past that apparently, and uh, we heard for some from some people that said. Uh, Perhaps you want to suggest Linux as well. And I think uh, the space that this is particularly po uh, popular is with people who are trying to reuse older equipment. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Pastor ben Benjamin Steenbach wrote to us and said he owns a MacBook Pro, um, but he actually runs Debian Linux on it. And uh, there's a learning curve for Linux, not as high as it used to be, but the whole Linux environment is almost everything you could possibly need is available for free. And uh, he says that Logos is the one standout, but he runs that on a virtual machine that he has access to with Windows. So um, there's even a workaround to get your Logos. So um, I put Pastor Steenbach in touch with our resident Linux expert, Pastor Stephen Daly. Uh, we know that Pastor Daly uses it in his church office as well. So uh, there's a Linux group amongst us, Martin, and that's great. That's a, certainly a viable operating system alternative. And thanks for uh, scolding us, too. I think that was well-deserved. <laughs> we should have uh, we should have brought Linux into the conversation, even though, I mean, I've got some experience, but I wouldn't call myself uh, somebody who could speak authoritatively on it. So, Yeah. A little feedback from Jimmy Pouts, who tweeted us to say, in my experience, I've had more freezing issues with Macs than PCs and I use PCs more than Macs. So he's not a fan of the spinning wheel of death, apparently. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I guess everyone's There's experience no will vary. operating system, yeah. That's Many right. Said that on the show, so. so. All right, time for me to get creative. Oh, and I just closed the link. We actually had more links shared from our friend, uh, Julia Wagon Connect. We'll see if I can uh, make my screen share work. Uh, starting with a link to... 
uh, notational. And Julia says she's found notational to be a good alternative for keeping up with notes. Martin, again, a productivity kind of thing. Uh, she says she's doing a lot of general reading and working on uh, Spanish with some language tools and the app that she's recording her findings in is this notational app available at notational.net. Hmm. Uh, there's even a dictation tool that allows you to record your notes verbally and the program writes them down for you. Uh, really great um, to, she says to jot down notes from your show from Wells Tech for easy access in the future. So she's organizing things by title and subject. It's a similar format to email, she says. And of course, there are other alternatives, but um, she's using it with her MacBook Pro and is loving notational. So if you're looking for a note taking app, perhaps this is the one for you. Cool. Also from Julia, she recommended um, typingonline.co.uk. And interestingly, um, typing skills is something that has become an important skill to teach, even to uh, pre-seminary and seminary students in the world missions. So um, in the past, she's used typingweb.com. And that's something that I recommended a while back on the podcast. And she's really happy with that. This is just an alternative, typing.co.uk, um, for those that are learning to type. Typeonline.co.uk. Right. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Cool. Uh, she says she's still amazed to see some medical professionals search and peck as they type up a prescription. So mm -hmm. everybody could enhance their typing skills, and a couple of free online programs may help you do that. We'll have links in the show notes. So, Great. Thanks, Julia. All right. Yeah. Next up, um, some Twitter chatter from Gail Potratz. She linked to the official announcement from Snagit that they do have a Chrome app available now. Um, and you can also use their, their new app called Fuse on your mobile devices to sync data from your mobile device to your Snagit or Camtasia software so that you can produce videos and things like that. So this is kind of tying together all of your your input platforms so that you can include them in whatever projects you're creating with their software. So two different announcements here. Um, I'm guessing both are equally exciting to TechSmith fans like me, but um, they uh, are just enhancing more and more what you can do with the TechSmith toolkit. Sweet. Yep. Another tweet um, from our friend Jason Schmidt was to mummify it. Mummify.it allows you to make a permanent copy of anything online for free. And so if you're concerned that your favorite web page may drift off into Never Never Land someday in the future and you want to have a permanent copy of it, you just paste the URL there. Um, it actually will continue to link to your web page for as long as it exists. And then when it's done, uh, it'll switch to their cached version of the web page. Your link that you create and mummify it never changes, um, but has your web page saved forever, supposedly. Well, at least as long as Mummify exists. Yes. So, <laughs> there you go. I wanted to, uh, I think I'm up next, and I tweeted out a couple days ago an article I ran across, which uh, is kind of shaking the, uh, the, the clergy world these days, and uh, that has to do with a judge striking down a law that gives clergy tax-free housing allowances. That's been a, that's a law that's been in effect since I believe the 50s and uh, allowed uh, clergy to declare a certain portion of housing costs or home costs of home ownership or just in general rental um, that uh, was tax-free and um, a judge, uh, I think it was in Madison of all places, uh, not surprising, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, struck that down, uh, U.S. Circuit Court, and um, I'm sure this won't not be the last we hear of this because I think there'll be some uh, some appeals and, and so on and so forth. But in general, this is uh, um, this is a big deal, and uh, I think originally the law was put in place because uh, many clergy, most clergy, were asked to live in parsonages, so they were never able to to claim any uh, you know, mortgage 
uh, interest deductions, uh, which is a big tax benefit. So I think that's why the law was originally passed. But now that's being contested, so we'll see where that all goes. But it will affect uh, a lot of our people. Yep. All right. One more uh, thing to share under community feedback for this week, and it is a link that uh, Principal Tom Rose now shared with us via Google+. And it's a new app for iOS only from our friends at Scholastic, those people that have all the great books for students. And this is actually geared toward teachers, I believe. It's a mobile app that allows you to scan uh, the book's barcodes. So say you're in Barnes & Noble scan, uh, looking through some books, trying to get ideas for reading opportunities for your students. Um, you can scan the barcode. It will look up the book and tell you information about it, like what level, what guided reading level, what Lexile measure, um, all those different kinds of things. And you can save and manage your book list um, through the app, so I'm sure they'll tell you, you know, what the cost is through their their Scholastic um, resources and things like that. So you can search for books as well. So it's not just about being out and uh, scanning the books, but you can use their database of more than 50,000 children's books to to learn more information about them. All those different measurements and things are available. So looks like a great app, and I'm assuming, uh, yeah, a free app for iOS users from Scholastic Book Wizard. Check it out. Great feedback this week. Uh, thank you very much to those who contributed, and I would encourage all of our listeners to, if you, if you run across something that you want to, to share, a question that you'd like to ask, uh, something for us to consider, or uh, maybe a future show topic, let us know. Go to wellstech.wells.net. That's our uh, show notes page where you can find all the information from show to show all the ministry resources we talk about, all our picks and tips and so on and so forth, but you also find opportunity there to connect with us. Just look along, along the top right and you see all kinds of icons where you can pin something, use Facebook, Twitter, Digo, send us an email, uh, of even a voicemail, or just post a, a comment on our show notes page to one of the uh, show notes. Uh, our episode notes, and uh, we will see that, and we'll include it on the show. That's uh, one of the best features, in my opinion, of this show. So please consider commenting about your experiences with technology and ministry. That's right. We're thankful for those comments, right? We Mark? are. <laughs> we are. And we're we're uh, tying up our Thanksgiving celebration. The Indian and uh, Pilgrim guy are going to eat lunch apparently real soon uh, but we want to remind our listeners that we do have a show coming up next week and we're excited to have Gail Potratz back with us for our educational technology focused show. Gail's going to um, lift the veil on all her language arts tricks so technology for the language arts classroom and she has a long list of ideas to share with us so I'm excited about that conversation. You mentioned already that Ryan Rachi from Manitowoc Lutheran High School is going to be joining us uh, for an interview kind of based off of his recent uh, convocation presentation at Martin Luther College and he has some interesting things to share as well so EdTech Focus next week. Tune in. Cool. As we close the show, uh, many people are now beginning to take advantage of the free music downloads that we're providing at the end of each show. And this is one of our artists that we haven't featured before, Elaine Stint. She is a harpist. Her website, harpelaine.com. And we'll be sharing via link on our show notes page her song, Joyful, Joyful. It'll be available for one week for you to download. So take advantage of that beautiful music that Elaine has put together for us and has been gracious enough to share with uh, with all of our listeners. Sounds like an appropriate title for Thanksgiving, Mark. It is, absolutely. Sally, have a blessed Thanksgiving. And, Thank you, uh, too. We would also uh, pray that all of our listeners and viewers do the same. Uh, we will talk to you next week. Thanks for joining us.